Great. Orwell, welcome to Cassandra. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. So, Orwell, we just talked about before we hit the record button that times have really changed. Like not long ago, everyone was happy trading. We were in this absolute gains scenario. And it was really um, about win-win, um, even though a lot of people always said win-win means China wins twice. So, you know, you observed China for many, many decades. And, you know, just give us, before we go into maybe more specifics, like the, what's the problem? Why is this not business as usual anymore? What has changed over the last years? Well, I think we've seen a, a subtle but incredibly powerful sort of transformation uh, of China's sense of itself, uh, which has transformed the chemistry between it and the outside world. And I include Europe, Australia, Japan, Korea, right. the United States, et cetera, in that, uh, in that rubric. Um, you know, during the period that began when Mao died, Deng Xiaoping came to power and the reform and opening era began, there was a very sort of transactional awareness in China that China actually did need some help from the outside world. Right. And uh, this was not a kind of a new recognition at the end of the Qing dynasty. There was a version of this. It wasn't that they wanted to become like us. It wasn't that they were e either uh, ready to sort of slowly, completely be absorbed by the global sort of culture of uh, markets and liberal democracy and rules-based order. It was that they wanted the thing that they've always wanted most over the last century and a half, and that is to be a rejuvenated, wealthy, and powerful nation that wouldn't be kicked around. It would not be the, quote, sick man of Asia. Right. exploited, colonialized, imperialized. So engagement fit very well into that rubric. Um, Nixon and Kissinger went over. They didn't call it engagement then. but And so it moved on down through the decades. And there was a tremendous amount of rather friendly borrowing because the transactional need for China to learn how to uh, adopt technology, develop industry, depended upon them being more... Um, uh, sort of dissolvable in the global marketplace. What has changed and what has sort of put a stake through the heart of engagement, which presupposed that, that China and the outside world were not going to turn into ca carbon copies of each other, but they were going to slowly converge, is that Xi Jinping has a different playbook. He now mm -hmm. imagines China has attained sufficient wealth and power and rejuvenation that it doesn't need to subserviently borrow and give a little to get a little with the West. So he's in, a, in another act of the play where it's China's turn, uh, turn not only to uh, act as a, as a great power, but it's, it's sort of turn also to be able to set the rules of the road and even do a little bullying just as the great powers once did to China. So we're in a very transformed world where I think it's as much a question of, of not of national interest or, or economic interest, but this deep and abiding historical yearning for China to be a country of consequence that is not only equal, China never did equal very well, even in the dynastic period, but superior. Sets, it's the big dog on the block, at, at least in Asia, if not in the world. And thus, it wants to transcend and, and really uh, undermine the order such as it is, where America is sort of the big dog, even in Asia, to some degree. So this is the transformed world that business finds itself in. Now, there are plenty of profits still to be made in China. And there are not a lot of great other supply chains around the world that country like company like Apple can just plug into. So people don't know quite where to run in this circumstance. It isn't as if they'll they can move from from country from China to country B just in 
there aren't, aren't any big scale alternatives. And this creates a tremendous dilemma. The old world of engagement and convergence has ended. We're in a world of hostility, of antagonism and friction and companies which, you know, drunk the Kool-Aid during engagement, they're stuck with it and they're not quite sure where to run. May I ask you, do you think that is because of a different leadership or do you think that is really just the normal strategic calculus? So you grow stronger. Obviously, now you have the ability to change the rules. Well, let's change the rules. Yes, I think there is an ineluctable yearning amongst uh, uh, some a, a leader like Xi Jinping to be able to change the rules. And not only does he want to change the rules, but whereas under uh, the earlier leaders and, you know, with Deng Xiaoping, Hu Yaobang, Zhao Ziyang, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, these guys all sort of thought, well, <clears throat> you know, we're, 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 we're we're not going to become democratic, but we're not going to resist. We'll have the foundations from America come, the universities, the ballet troops, the orchestras, the businessmen, and we'll we'll get along well enough. Xi Jinping doesn't see it that way. He sees democracy and Leninism, the one party system of China, as in competition and opposed to each other and he said this again in Moscow. He thinks his system, one party Leninist system run by the Chinese Communist Party under the dictatorship of the proletariat is superior. So he's not just selling Chinese shoes and robots and, and, and chemicals. He's now selling a system. And that's what gives this, this whole standoff more than just a, a strategic uh, sort of national interest trade interest uh, uh, cast, it gives it a very deeply ideological cast. So the system seems to be alluring to several countries, right? So do you think the way forward or the solution is just let's play out or let, let this competition play out? Or what is the kind of the solution to this kind of, okay, engagement as we know it before is over? We obviously are in a different phase now. It seems to be all encompassing. So every kind of business, so you'd see Chinese companies are having issues in the Western world and obviously vice versa. Um, where do you see, like, how do you see this system like really changing? Like, how can I, um, what's the solution to have like, um, well, I wouldn't say a normal relationship, but it is not just, um, you know, disentangling and just like deglobalizing, but what do you see still like a solution for, uh, for to make this work? Well, so the solution is the most elusive uh, a goal on the horizon, because what we need is a new operating system. And right. we, we are seeking one at a time when the contradictions between uh, both sides are growing ever more stark. And uh, an example of that, of course, is most graphically illustrated the last three days when Xi Jinping was in Moscow. And what you see now is not just uh, realignments of trade, sort of break down to some degree of the old global system where it didn't matter where you made things and what kind of government they had, as long as you could get them quickly, rapidly and cheaply. What we see now is a almost uh, something like the World War II uh, uh, axis and allies uh, uh, blocks. Uh, we see Xi Jinping going to Moscow, teaming up with Iran and Saudi Arabia, flirting with Orban and, and Hungary and Erdogan and, and, and uh, Turkey. And, there, and of course, there's North Korea and a few other places like that. So. As I say, um, I think Xi Jinping has given this thing a very uh, uh, complicated political uh, uh, nature, which makes it extremely difficult to imagine how we're going to find a solution. Uh, uh, that's what Nixon and Kissinger found in 1972, uh, a way to realign things. But then there was 
the common enemy of the Soviet Union, which at that point, Russia, China was very opposed to. We don't have such an obvious geopolitical enemy to get to gang up together against. Uh, we do have things like climate change or cancer or nuclear weapons, but we seem utterly, or pandemics, but we seem utterly incapable of coming together with China on these things. And I think that's partially not because of the United States or Europe's refusal to play, but because Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party have a habit of holding one issue hostage to another. In other words, we won't play on climate change with you if you don't hand over Taiwan, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, you know, one could go on. So that's where we are. And it's a very uh, different and infinitely more hostile relationship than we've had over the last few decades. Does this make us more like China? Because if I think about it, the level of state interference in business or, you know, the, in, let's say, recent um, green energy kind of packages under the Inflation Reduction Act and all point pretty much towards, okay, we actually becoming a little bit more like China. We are, we are controlling more and more the commanding heights of the economy and steering it towards increasingly national interest. Do you see that or would you yes. disagree with that? No, I, I think that's uh, well said and uh, does uh, describe what's going on. We are now adopting industrial policies that are not so dissimilar from sort of the centralized command and control of the state, which characterizes China. Even the Republicans, which are massive uh, free traders traditionally and, and find it abhorrent to have government intruding into things, now are saying, well, well, almost saying whatever it takes if we need some government organization, intrusion, economic help uh, to, to uh, best China, to compete with China, maybe even to beat China in a war. Uh, a very sort of, uh, uh, you know, obvious example of this, of course, is microprocessors, uh, right. semiconductor, where we have the Science and Chips Act to make us less dependent on Asia because most of the chips are made in Taiwan, China, Japan, and Korea, we've forfeited our supply chains. We do the design, they do the fabbing, packaging, testing. So we're very dependent on, on an area for the most elemental uh, 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 element in our whole industrial process and our whole Internet of Things life. On, on the region of the world, which besides the Ukraine is the most dangerous and the most fraught, particularly the Taiwan Straits. At the same time, though, um, I, I guess you would agree that the way forward increasingly will be some sort of disentangling of supply chains, possibly. And um, because you shortly mentioned this act access um, allies kind of, you know, scenario um, where um, obviously the US was always or is always pretty good with allies ever since um, you know Trump or the Biden administration came in so um, you know what do you see the players what do you see the the fronts the economic spheres of influence so you already kind of you know mapped out a little bit the, the you know the the axis mm -hmm. like um, from the ally side like what kind of interesting uh, initiatives do you see we obviously have a lot of things in the security realm going on do you see anything else that kind of is interesting, like, or from a you know the the players that are really involved? Well, I think if you look at the military side, yes, we see a tremendously uh, new alignment. Uh, we have AUKUS with the Brits, the right. Australians, the Americans. We have the Five Eyes with Canadians, Americans, New Zealand, Australia, Britain. We have now the Quad. Uh, with uh, Japan, uh, Australia, India, and the United States, and now South Korea wants to join it. So one would have to say, that, and then, of course, America is closer than ever to Europe. And you have even Germany that had the China needle in its arm deeper than any country 
uh, through the auto industry. They're making making enormous profits in China. Let's but see even, how long. Yeah, well, I mean, even Olaf Scholz, who who now has had uh, ignominiously the title to get Scholz appended to his name, uh, is beginning to come around and recognize that uh, China is not such fair weather sailing. Now, this does not mean that everybody's left China. There's because, interestingly enough, it's not that countries aren't looking for off ramps. The problem is there aren't any off ramps that are easy. So companies tend to want to prevaricate. And you asked the question: Does this climate sort of in in, in uh, unavoidably lead to more decoupling? Um, it's hard to predict. But usually what does happen in the world is that political climates precede actual market realignments and military alliance adjustments. And I think if you see anything, particularly with Xi Jinping, you know, hugging it up with, with Putin in Moscow, even as Putin is, is committing war crimes in the Ukraine, this is not good brand management by Xi. Right. I mean, anybody can, can look at that and be horrified. And I don't think he kind of understands that to the degree he should. So it seems to me that uh, you, 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 you have to kind of put your finger in the wind and see which way it's blowing. Even though there's money to be made still in China and people are making it, uh, the future does not look bright. And we don't have to look much farther than the Ukraine to see what happens when somebody attacks someone else. And the Ukraine isn't exactly like Taiwan, but it's similar enough to, to send shivers, it should send shivers down the spines of leaders, nas national leaders and corporate executives. Because once that trigger is pulled, game over. It doesn't matter how much you don't want to decouple. It's it's going to you're going to get decoupled. Not only that, you're going to lose your shirt in China. Could, could we say that, like, obviously, the US China relationship, you know, for the foreseeable future, marked by competition, or even like some sort of Cold War, whatever you want to call it, obviously, the, the wording might be different. But <clears throat> don't you see like, very interesting opportunities coming up for other, let's say countries, because of this competition? <clears throat> Can't this competition lead to kind of a, a variety of kind of, you know, opportunities? Because, or, or do you think like, okay, so smaller countries will have to lean to one side or even companies will have to lean to one side? I think like the one thing that we saw with Ukraine that um, a lot of companies are pulling out of the Russian market, which was um, quite surprising to me. So, um, you know, would you say like, you know, there are opportunities for, for other, for for companies or even countries? Well, this is sort of constructive destruction, right? Sort of the notion that, uh, you know, Mao Zedong had an expression, if you don't destroy, you can't, uh, uh, you can't rebuild. Right. So what you're suggesting is, is the destruction of the old order, which is always catastrophic in one way and tremendously disruptive but also can create an enormous number of new opportunities and be very creative because all kinds of new new things have to arise. And I think we may be perched a little bit on the edge of such a thing. The danger, of course, is that we could end up in a world war. And the, the, we're sort of halfway there with Putin in, in, in um, uh, the Ukraine and, and all of the liberal democratic countries around the world sending leopard tanks, Abrams one tanks, you know, um, all kinds of high Mars, you know, long range artillery. And now even Poland sending uh, fighter bombers. And the Czechs want to send fighter bombers. And so we're creeping up in Europe to a full scale war. And if she who shows very little inclination to, to uh, moderate himself and temper himself uh, were to do something 
in the South China Sea, there should be a, an altercation between an American military vessel or a British or French, even there, out there in the Straits now joining. Um, you know, things could come a cropper very, very easily. So that's really dangerous. And uh, that, that, of course, we've been through two world wars. We know what happens. It, it companies, doesn't matter who you are. You, you're, you're, you're dead in the water on the other side of the divide. So this is why I think it's almost inevitable that um, uh, we hope we don't have war and I hope we can find an off ramp, but it's not easy. And China does not show tremendous inclination to search in a, in a reciprocal way, no, nor I might say just Russia. And here, I think we do have to understand that Xi and Xi Jinping and, and Putin do share something that's deeper than any national interest. And that is a deep, deep sense of grievance against the West. Uh, it's a, almost a psychological syndrome of humiliation, victimization. I mean, one could go on. They feel they're disrespected, marginalized, impugned. And this is very, very deep. And it makes it very, very hard for them to uh, compromise. But uh, would it be with just the leaders? Or do you think that's like just a general sentiment that was in China, for example, there even before Xi Jinping? I remember in 2012, yeah. um, I could hear the same kind of, you know, voices. <laughs> you know, this is a deep sentiment that has come down from the last dynastic period when uh, great powers did semi-colonialize China, and China had a very bitter right. experience, couldn't defend itself. And this was the toxic brew uh, that Lenin wrote, wrote up in his On Imperialism, which China drank completely. They, they swallowed the Leninist views on theories on imperialism of China being exploited and colonialized, imperialized, occupied, and one could go on. So it's really, really deep. And it, 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 again, it's that sense of them not being esteemed. But the problem here is that, that it isn't simply that the West is doing something wrong and is arrogant and is throwing its weight around and being, being kind of uh, disrespectful of Russia and China. It's that China and Russia are not acting respectably. And therefore, it's extremely different, difficult for most countries in the, quote, liberal democratic world to respect them. Now, other countries in Africa and the sure. Belt and Road around the world, they, they don't care what China is all about as long as they get that football stadium or the highway or the, the train. Uh, but um, and so China just still does have some chops there. Uh, but um it's still the world is dividing like oil and water in a way that's very alarming. And uh, uh, diplomacy does not seem to have the, uh, the, the, the kind of the power at this point or the will on each side to get together and say, wait a minute, this is dangerous.